So, um, you, so you cover, uh, uh, you know, a lot of various diets, um, in, um, in your research, w what are the takeaways regarding the impact of, of these various diets on, uh, on Alzheimer's? Well, the various diets, the standard American diet is a good way to um, get uh, Alzheimer's disease. Um, you know, all the meat and cheese is going to make things worse. Uh, paleo, keto, and all of those heavy meat fat diets would be just horrible because it's also true that it's not just Alzheimer's disease. It's often coexisting with vascular dementia where the arteries are clogged up in the brain, just like they are in the heart. And so it's difficult, we call it perfusion, for the blood to get in there with oxygen and glucose and clean out the waste and do its job. It can't get there because you're all plugged up from too much saturated. So any high saturated fat diet is gonna be really bad for the brain, plus all the pollutants in that fat, from you know the environmental pollutants that are bioaccumulated in the animal fat. So those would be the, the worst diets. The best, of course, would be whole food plant diets. Now, I don't have a problem if people want to eat a little bit of kind of easy vegan foods. They vary. And as my wife pointed out, if you read the label, make sure they don't have coconut oil or too much saturated fat, then most of those are dramatically healthier than the meat alternative. So, you know, a lady in the clinic says, well, I can eat a hamburger or I can eat your processed fake hamburger. And that's got to be worse, right? And so I, I went over the studies that where you get, you know, 250 times, 250% chance increased risk of heart attack. And all the cancers and the strokes and everything else that the meat increases, but the processed alternative meats do not. So it's okay for people to transition with familiar foods and then get into like my wife's cookbook, the Dementia Prevention Cookbook, also available on my website where people can have recipes that are even healthier than the alternative meats or cheeses or milks or ice creams. Great, thank you. And reflecting on the outcomes of the Hawaii Dementia Prevention Trial, beyond Alzheimer's, what about just cognitive decline? You know, people are, are very, you know, as we age, are very concerned with losing, you know, their their mental faculties. What what are the takeaways from that that trial? Well, our trial looked principally at nutrients and food. However, exercising your brain is a great way to keep it strong. And also physical exercise is a great way to, to keep your brain clean and to get the... Um, sorry, uh, distraction there. Um, antioxidants are really good to keep your brain sharp too. And for that, fruits and vegetables, beans, nuts, and seeds. Anti-inflammatories are in all of those plant foods if they're whole, uh, but perhaps a lot less if they've been processed a bunch. So, you know, beans are just a wonderful food and they have anti-inflammatories, antioxidants, and really healthful. And there's lots of ways to cook them so that they don't bother your digestion. So these are the ways that we can keep our brain sharp Use it, exercise, and eat whole plant foods and keep those saturated fats low so you get good blood to your brain. So uh, according to the research of uh, Dr. Michael Greger, um, alcohol consumption is a leading cause of death and disability. Uh, the safe, According to him, the safest level is none. Do you recommend zero alcohol? And um, what about all the studies that say red wine is good for you at some level? <laughs> Well, um, I would say that red wine is one of those uh, things that has both good and bad effects. So you have to look at the pluses and the minuses. Um, now, stress and anxiety are tremendously difficult for the brain. We have many times found that when people reduce their stress and anxiety, that they are thinking clearer. And so if a glass of red wine in the evening reduces your stress and anxiety, that can be a helpful tool. However, Michael Greger has a point that any intake of alcohol increases your risk of specifically a few cancers such as throat and esophageal cancer. So um, this, this is a bit of a problem. You have to balance these two things together. 
um, perhaps you could find a different way to relax and you could get your grapes before they're made into wine, in which case red grapes are just fantastic with their resveratrol and anthocyanins and really helpful. And a lot of that contrib is contributed also into the wine. So I have to say that there are, are good and bad aspects to red wine. It's not a clean cut, yes or no. Great, thank you. And um, so one of the topics that we've hit upon uh, with multiple speakers is cholesterol, proper levels. Um, so normally we, we it's talked about with um, in the context of heart disease, but um, since I have you here, we can talk about it in the context of Alzheimer's. What is the healthy range for for cholesterol in in your opinion, or or based on your research, really? Yeah, so cholesterol is something that's made in our bodies but should not be eaten. It's really that simple. Now, some people are questioning if we make enough cholesterol in our bodies. We actually make seventy quadrillion molecules of cholesterol every second. Okay, that sound like enough. 70 quadrillion molecules per second of cholesterol is made in the human body. Yes, it's an essential part of cell membranes. It's a starting point for vitamin D synthesis in the skin. It's used for uh, sex hormones. It is necessary to have it in the body. It is not necessary to eat it. If you don't eat it, you'll be fine. If you do eat it, then that becomes a problem. But generally, cholesterol is raised by eating saturated fats in excess of 12 grams per day. And so if we keep our saturated fats low, then our blood cholesterol will bring a smile to the physician who reads it. Great, thank you. And what are the essential medical tests that you would recommend everyone to consider getting regularly to ensure optimal health and early detection of potential health issues? Well, that I have to say, Michael, is just a little bit out of my expertise. Um, I work with a lot of medical doctors who order these tests, but. Uh, for me personally, I want to have a vitamin B12 test, which there are, it's good to include a methyl malonic acid test for vitamin B12. That's the best one, I think, that you can possibly get. If you can't get that one, just a regular B12 test to make sure you're getting enough. Um, I like to have a test on total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, uh, just a good lipid panel. Uh, that your doctor will order for you should give you all of, all of that information. Of course, it's a good idea to look at your glucose and HbA1c, your glycated hemoglobin, to see how you're handling your blood sugars. And um, I, I'm going to probably have to leave that up to the medical experts who order these tests, but there are a few ideas there. But vitamin D3 would be a really good test to have. It's not always included, but it's a good one to get. Make sure that your levels are high enough. Great, thank you. And I'm going to have one of our uh, participants ask a question. Evelyn C., state where you're from, and ask your question. And we just have uh, two more minutes. So Yeah, I'm asking this question on behalf of Carol, who can't seem to get on. Uh, okay. to put her, her question in the chat, um, which is, do roasted and charred vegetables create AGEs? And I'm also concerned about air fried tofu. <laughs> well, you're in luck because uh, advanced glycation end products require um, a Maillard reaction, and that simply can't happen with the presence of water. So your tofu has lots of water, your vegetables have water. You can barbecue, broil, or well, preferably not fry with rancid oils, but you could barbecue or broil those, uh, maybe a shish kebab of vegetables, uh, tofu, uh, mushrooms, you're making me hungry. No advanced vacation and products will form. So um, we've got one minute left. It, uh, do you have any closing thoughts what you'd leave, like to leave uh, our, our participants with? Well, I just want to say thanks. Thanks very much for listening. Um, I am here on the west coast of Mexico in the Biblioteca Digital. And uh, <laughs> I'm grateful to La Presidenta for allowing me to use this facility today. And thank you, Michael, for your kind words and uh, and for the, the good job of moderating this. Thank and you. thank you, Carol Casal, for your comment. Uh, you know what to do. And I have all those books for you to read and just get them all read by next year. And um, you'll have even better questions. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. If we can unmute the audience.